sink sense and look at it through other people's eyes. Take some time and reflect on what you believe in your soul. Cause that is the key to life. You gotta let the negativity go. Hello and welcome to the What the Fox podcast with your two hosts, Lindsay Fox and Amber Ross. Here on What the Fox, we deconstruct social norms to build better lives. And in today's episode, I do want to go ahead and put out there for you guys a bit of a trigger warning. We will be covering a lot of topics that include um, sexual assault, and we want to make sure that you are prepared and aware ahead of time. Obviously, always love you for tuning in and listening and understand if you need to um, take care of yourself in other ways. As a reminder, this ep- oh yes. <laughs> As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by therapyappointment.com and we are so grateful for their sponsorship. Lindsay, would you like to introduce our wonderful guest today? I would. Hey y'all, welcome back to What the Fox podcast. So, today we have Olivia Grella joining us. She is someone that I met in grad school in Massachusetts. Welcome, Olivia. Hello. So Olivia is a PhD student at University of Wyoming um, in her experimental psychology program. So this is going to be very interesting for us to dive into this today because her specialization is in psychology and the law where she conducts research on jury decision making in cases of sexual assault, which is fascinating. Uh, So on top of that, Olivia excuse me, specifically studies ways to reduce and mitigate the effects of victim blaming and rape myths within criminal cases of sexual assault. So we are definitely going to dive into um, myth busting certain aspects of uh, this topic. So as Amber mentioned previously, this episode definitely comes with a bit of a trigger warning. So outside of her work, Olivia is a dog mom, which we all can relate to because Amber and I are as well. What's that? Yeah. Love my pup. Had to throw that into my intro. (laughs) I love it. I love it. She has a a great Pyrenees that is cute as can be and just a big old white fluff ball (laughs) of love. Uh, So on top of that, Olivia is a long distance runner and she's originally from Watertown, Connecticut. So welcome, Olivia. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so honored to have you here to talk about this specific topic because it's just not one that gets discussed like mm, ever. I was going to say ever, never, never have I heard a discussion on it. So thrilled that you're here to chat with us, Olivia. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just say right off from the bat, this is something that I talk about very casually um, because it's conversations that I have a lot. Um, It is a very serious topic. Uh, which is why we give like the trigger warning. And it's not something that I'll go into like too much specific details about, but we will hit some of the specifics. So please do not take me speaking very calm and normally about it as this is less of a serious thing. Right. Of course. And I think just with anyone in a helping profession uh, where there's a lot of exposure to trauma or vicarious trauma or looking at statistics like this, Um, and meeting some of these people firsthand, there is a level of compartmentalization that has to take place. There's some desensitization to certain aspects of things that you kind of have to have present in order to work through it. So, um, you know, law enforcement officers, doctors, you know, your ER nurse, uh, what have you. So it's certainly a thing and there's no judgment here. This is a safe space. And um, thank you for kind of inserting that disclaimer. We know that you have lots of compassion and empathy, Olivia. Yes, I do care. (laughs) Yes, you do. Very much so. Um, So I think first things first, I kind of want to just dive in the fact that you haven't always had an interest in this particular research topic, right? Nope. I have gone all over the place in psychology and how I ended up here. I think if I asked like my younger self, I'd be like, nope, especially with being in Wyoming. (laughs) Uh, Lindsay and I were joking about this at the start. Like, if you asked me, would I end up in Wyoming? Nope. I would never leave the East Coast. Um, But here I am in the mountains. So crazy. I would have never seen that for you either. Because like, I automatically associate you with Boston, frankly. So (laughs) yeah, I have that personality. I am a very East Coast and proud. Uh, specifically New England and proud. So totally. my personality with everyone who's super, super nice out here has been <laughs> interesting. <laughs> uh, they're a little bit too warm and lovey for you, huh? Mm-hmm. 
Yes, but it's okay. It's growing on me. Okay. All right. Well, when you decide to stay out there lifelong, I'll be. Uh... Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, no. okay. So history has said, don't say nope, because you just, you never know, friend. <laughs> well, that's True. an excellent segue now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, because... yes. Because that's just it. Olivia didn't plan on getting into this line of research. She didn't know she was going to pursue a PhD. Um, so, you know, one thing that has kind of stayed consistent is that Olivia has always had an interest and fascination in, in really depressing research that not everyone can get on board with. <laughs> yes. Lindsay knew me in our master's. I was very, I hate saying, this goes, this goes back to me saying I talk about things calmly. It, it, I hate saying it, but it's like, I was fascinated with eating disorders. Um, not the, doesn't mean that I liked it, but it was like, that of was course. what I was really into. And from un my undergrad, I was too. Um, and it's something that I always thought I'd end up in. And then I'm currently doing sexual assault research. So I kind of did like a big switch. I also was convinced I was going to be a therapist, did yeah. that for a hot second, and then was like, I'm good um I realized very <laughs> I realized very quickly that I was interested in the research sides of things mm. which I think was very apparent throughout most of my education like I was always totally. into research mm -hmm. um but it's I gonna be a little all over the place like I think back to before eating disorders I want to be a high school guidance counselor fun fact oh, wow um so when I did my undergrad, um, and I kind of really attribute where I am today and like the researcher, the professor, like the future psychologist I am to where I did my undergrad at Eastern Connecticut State University, um, I had to take two research classes. And I remember going into it, I was very angry. So I was like, I want to be a guidance counselor. Why do I have to do <laughs> research? I was like, this makes no sense. I don't want to do it. Don't make me. And of course, it was a requirement to graduate. So I had to yep. take them. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, I was like, damn, this is actually quite cool. Yes. Yeah. And you're actually um, pretty damn good at it because you helped yeah. me with stats in grad school. Yes. <laughs> I'm actually pretty decent at it. Um, and I was like, okay, maybe I'll go more like the clinical psych route. Um, and originally I was just looking at masters. And then one of my undergrad professors actually, um, I went to her and I was like, hi, please help me with applying. Um, and she pulled up PhD programs because she thought that was what I meant. And I was like, I am not qualified for that. And she was like, what are you talking about? Like you would be an excellent candidate. And that's kind of like how I ended up even like believing in myself in the first place. And here I am. Awesome. What's it? Graduated in 2017. However many years later, um, still talking to some of my undergrad professors, two of them specifically who are just like badass women in psych who really inspired me to be here. And they were That's still awesome. like cheering me on the whole way. Um, and they were actually the first two before I told my boyfriend and my family that I got it. <laughs> I told them. <laughs> I love I that. that. That sounds about um, right. <laughs> yes. So I went straight into my master's in clinical five days after graduation from my undergrad. Do wow. not recommend. Um, take a break. <laughs> yeah. No break whatsoever. No. Wow. So I felt like my senior year and as Lindsay knows, we didn't even have summers off in our nope. master's program. Mm. So I felt like I just had three full years of school. Um, you did. It's because you I, did. I did. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, the whole time I was in clinical, I liked it. I didn't mind it. Um, but I remember the first time I applied to PhD programs after our master's. I applied to work in clinical and in eating disorders and in my head. I was like, I'm actually kind of okay if I don't get in this cycle. And I think I said a couple of times, I was like, if I don't get into clinical, I'm going social. I'm going like the experimental route. And mm -hmm. here I am. I did not get in, um, got rejected from all 10 schools, which at the time was very hard, but I'm actually like 
I don't yeah. think I would be happy mm. if I was still working in eating disorders and being a therapist. Um, yeah. I mean, well, you were very passionate about it, but I think, you know, there were a lot of reasons why you would have burnt out really quickly from, from that field. Yeah, it was, I'm, I give a lot of myself in my jobs. Like I do it now too. And luckily I have an incredible mentor who is like, you need to take a break. And I actually try and listen to her. Um, but it's like with eating disorders, I definitely got into it for the wrong reasons. I struggled with an eating disorder for most of my life. Not most of my life, like seven years of my life, which I guess is a good That's portion a big of chunk. it. Yeah. 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 Um, significant and, period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely, a lot of people go into like mental health fields because they've experienced it. And that's absolutely not a problem. Like people yeah, do it all the time all. and are successful just absolutely. for me and someone who was recovering at the time, I more went into it to try and fix myself rather than mm. fix other people. And I was very committed and dedicated to it. Um, but it's like I was at work helping others and then I would come home and try and work on myself. So there was never a break. Yeah. And I would have burnt out very, very quickly. And also yeah. I just wasn't I feel bad for saying it, but I wasn't interested in the treatment aspect of it. I've always been, and I think this speaks to like my research side, like how did we get here type of yeah. person? And then I'm like, yes. someone else can take you. Um yes. can treat you. I distinctly remember that um, during the time that we were doing our um, internship and practicum when, so Olivia and I actually started out doing therapy together um, at the same clinic. And I remember distinctly when Olivia, there would be moments where she's just like, I don't think I want to be a therapist. I really want to do the yeah. research side. I really like the research side. Like it's so hard to do the clinical intervention piece. Um, but also to your point, Olivia, you know, when we're, if we're not prior prioritizing our own uh, self as like number one, you know, it, it, it becomes near impossible to, to juggle all the balls and expect us to mm -hmm. not drop one, you know? So yeah. I'm proud of you for figuring out what the right path is for you. And I think that in today's episode where you're, you know, you're going to shed some light on some really important factors that um, need to be shared so that we can have our awareness brought to this, um, hidden topic, so to speak. We never think yeah. about how is how does jury selection even happen for this sort of thing. So I think just to kind of segue into that space, I would love to um, ask you, be, without spending too much time on it, I suppose, but uh, was there a specific case or public case or <laughs> incident that brought your um, your passion forward and this awareness of like, wow, I really, really want to pursue the advocacy role of this through research. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's a lot of sexual assault cases in the media where the victim just gets blamed completely. Yeah. Um, but my yeah. first moment of like, WTF, what is happening uh, was the Brock Turner case. Mm -hmm. I think that happened when I was in high school, actually. And I just remember seeing it and being like, are you joking? Do you mind sharing with our listeners who are not familiar with the Brock Turner case? Do you mind just kind of giving like a couple yeah. sentence overview of what that case was about? I think he was, a I think it was at Stanford. I might be wrong. I'm sorry if it wasn't at Stanford for it's linking. It's okay. Just gen generic overview. Yeah. Um, but he was was an athlete who two people found him assaulting a clearly incapacitated woman. Um, and she, like they called the police and charges ended up getting brought against him. And even though there was witnesses kind of seeing him assaulting this woman, the judge was like, well, you are a well-established good swimmer and a good person. Therefore you get the shortest sentence ever. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of just like completely disregarded the fact that he is a rapist. Um, in spite and of there being witnesses and people who witnesses and in this everything. Case. It was and horrifying. I think at the time, yeah, the victim couldn't quite remember, but since then she's actually come out and like shared her story and like what happened. And 
like these are real people um, who get yeah. assaulted and it's kind of a slap in the face to be like, oh, you, your rapist was someone who was well off and a good swimmer. Like, yeah, therefore so, you don't yeah. need to go to jail. Right. Like, Here's your privilege at your finest. So we'll yeah. minimize the sentence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, it, it just seemed like a complete miscarriage of justice in a lot of ways. So I can 100%. absolutely appreciate where this kind of spearheaded the interest of psychology and the law and how this comes yeah. to circle. Um, so maybe just for the sake of diving in, um, what would you say as like, maybe if we took like top five myths and kind of went through them, uh, what would you say is one of the myths that you have come across with regard to victim blaming or how this plays out in your research and what you've discovered? Yeah, so the one I am currently dealing with the most is this idea that like, real rape victims like fight back against their attacker and that like mm. real victims are hysterical and crying mm. um and that's not true what happens but it doesn't happen as much so there's what's called um tonic immobility and tonic immobility is that like freeze response so yes. we see it in people you see it in animals like the deer in headlights you kind of just freeze and in a recent not recent 2017 i think it was yeah there was a 2017 study done that looked at like tonic immobility in rape survivors and 70 percent of them experienced some form of like mm. freezing during their response so it's more common for people to freeze when being attacked than to fight back so saying that real victims only and for those of you just listening and can't see me, I'm putting real in quotation marks, <laughs> um, yeah. saying that like real victims fight back all of the time is just not true. Also, when you have like a trauma that happens to you, like we are very good at seeing all of the types of crimes and being empathetic towards a victim. But for some reason, when it's rape, we have these different ideas and expectations mm, so yes, it's like yeah. when you see victims who just like this is an extreme like saw someone get murdered um and you see them standing there like frozen yep. that's normal you're like oh my god they just they're saw this shock. traumatic event they're in shock but with rape it's like why aren't they crying why aren't they hysterical yeah, right like they just experienced yeah. a trauma that's a common symptom of PTSD. It's a common right. symptom of trauma to have delayed emotional affect. That's right. Um, and especially when you think about how our nervous system is designed and what our amygdala in our brain is designed to do for us. I mean, yeah. that, that fight, flight, freeze, fawn response is contingent on how that person perceives the threat in the moment. And if, if your body and mind are aligned to say, staying still and frozen is going to keep me safe in this moment of time that's what's going to happen and and that's absolutely no shame toward the person no. who is a victim in this situation and it's yeah you're right it's frequently uh, misunderstood uh, and probably more so with a jury trial who is not trauma informed and they don't know all the psychology behind the scenes yeah so the current study i'm working on right now in progress is seeing like if we bring in like expert testimony, like someone who talks about what tonic immobility is, like can that like outweigh these like personal like beliefs that jurors may have? Or the defense loves to go hard with the victim blame, um, sadly, and kind of like trying to mitigate like what gets actually said during a trial. Like if you actually have an expert there will that fix it not fix it but like sure. help or it, bring a different perspective yeah. or help you know set off some light bulbs for the jurors i think i mean that makes sense to me being someone who obviously i don't have the experience that either of you have with the psychology side of things i'm more like i would be the juror sitting there thinking oh shit like i have no idea what i'm supposed to think say do like what is normal i think i would find yeah. that tremendously helpful to hear from an expert of you know how your body responds, how your brain responds and what that looks like. Yeah. And as jurors and as like normal people, 
even though we're not supposed to do it, um, a lot of jurors sit there and are like, oh, what would I do? They're like, yeah. I would fight back if that would happen. That's such mm-hmm. a common response that you hear. And it's like, I actually no don't know what you would do. That's right. Um, I'm someone who I'm like, I, in like any type of situation, when I get scared, I'm like, I would fight back. Uh, then you, two, two weeks ago, I was on a hike with my dog and I got terrified by something rustling in the bushes and I froze there and didn't move. Mm-hmm. Um, very different situation, of course. but yes. it's like, you just don't know how you're going to respond, even though you think you will a certain way. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, last night is a perfect example um, yeah. in my world where I was just commenting on how um, the neighbor across the street, their ring doorbell went off and alerted them that someone was kicking in the door to break into their house and they were not home. Thank goodness. Um, yeah. But when I got that text message and was told to call 911, I honestly like felt my body go into my own response um, because I thought, oh my gosh, if they're not at their house, I'm literally a matter of feet away from this mm-hmm. occurring. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I could feel my own body kind of kicking into its own response at that time and you're right you don't know how you're going to respond you have no idea if you're going to go into fight mode or if you're going to completely your body's just going to completely shut down so i i do agree i think that's a good thing to bring awareness to in that sense um is is there anything else about the tonic and mobility that you wanted to sort of bring to light or was there another myth that you wanted to touch on we can move to another myth um, and I will say almost all of these myths are really perpetuated by the media um, and mm. how they present cases. Um, slight side tangent, but I'll make it quick. Uh, the media hey. only <laughs> typically reports on like very specific types of cases. Um, I'll flip to another one because this ties in more. Um, reporting is a big thing in in like having difficulty in reporting a rape is very difficult um so there is this myth that kind of victims lie um victims change their stories um Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and it's a lot of the time those kind of controversial that are actually they're not actually controversial cases Mm -hmm. that hit the media um so to start with the victim's lie thing, no. <laughs> um, I'm someone yeah. who normally has research and will give you things. And this is one where it's just like, I, I shouldn't have to give you a statistic. Um, I did find one. Only about 2 to 10% reported by the Department of Justice are false allegations. It is not wow. common. It is very rare. Um, and the reason why they think that number is even at 10 percent is because some researchers don't do the best research studies and they find results that aren't actually there so they they're like that's actually probably closer to two percent than it is ten percent um so victims don't lie also just victims of any crime yeah Right. And also just when you're saying like, um, in terms of changing their story, right. And I've certainly, I've, I've certainly heard stuff like this happen just in the context of, of doing family therapy, of maybe a parent not believing their child when they are coming forward to say, this happened to me, or this family member did this thing to me. And, um, you know, that, that is the number one way to get me completely fired up and into like mama bear mode for sure, because, you know, these allegations of, well, you're changing your story. So it must not be true, or you're just lying, or you're just trying to get attention. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that there is so much fear driving, you know, front seat, obviously in the, in the car, because it's valid fear Mm -hmm. uh, for the trauma that someone's gone through. And so to speak up, number one, is incredibly, incredibly um, life altering and, and so hard to do. But then in terms of this idea of changing your stories, you might not remember everything because your body was in a state of trauma and trying to work through it. Yeah. If you just think of like typical 
PTSD responses, like we talked earlier about like the delayed emotional affect, Mm -hmm. you repress memories when they happen. It's common for trauma survivors to try and like repress what happened. And it takes a while to actually fully remember. It's not that they're changing their stories. Of course. It's that they actually just did not put that together or it wasn't until later that they actually sat down to process it with someone that they're like this actually happened and this is like yes how the event played out um and also the role of dissociative amnesia with this mm -hmm. i mean that's that's a huge piece of this that i would absolutely argue you know would be helpful for a a juror to understand is the presence of dissociative amnesia and what that means for the victim who, you know, is being blasted by opposing counsel for lying or changing their story. And it's like, well, no, these memories are coming to surface after they're gradually getting to a space of safety to talk about and to process what's going on. Yeah. What happened. And it just brings me back to like, we don't do this with other crimes. It's only because sexual assault has this, like he said, she said component to it. Um, that for some reason, society is just so much more judgmental. Like you wouldn't go after a victim of like an attempted murder for like messing up thoughts in your mind, but yeah. any type of relational violence, like intimate partner violence, sexual assault, all of that suddenly we're so much more judgmental and any little thing you can twist which is just Mm -hmm. wrong. Yes. Like what was she wearing or did she cheat on him first or Mm -hmm. did this happen or did that happen? And it's like, well, why is any of that shit relevant? It's It's not. not. No, it's not. No means no, you know? Yeah. It's just, it's it's wild. Yeah. Brings me up to another myth I had as kind of like this idea of like anything outside of saying yes to sex is consent so like it's just you agreeing it's not what you wore it's not alcohol it's not flirting it's not being in a relationship with someone or being married to someone just there's this this one gets me angry (laughs) because this is another one where i didn't even look up stats for it because like i did with the last one it's just no what you wear does not mean that you want to have sex with someone. Being drunk does not mean you want to have sex with someone. Being married or being in a relationship with someone does not mean you want to have sex with someone. Um, flirting with someone does not mean you want to have sex with someone. So whenever in the media or in trial, it's portrayed as like, they were drunk. It's like, yes, they were drunk and they could not give consent. Exactly. Yes, and yes, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and they were wearing a short skirt. Okay. And and what's your point? Yeah. It's just like that is not consent. The only thing that is consent is saying yes and continuing to agree to it throughout the encounter. You can change your mind. I didn't write that one down, but um, like you can change your mind at any time and say no. That's right. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's another thing that is important to emphasize is particularly, again, during that, that piece of providing psychoeducation to jurors who are being selected for this. Um, yeah. It's, I kind of can't help but to wonder, it's like, how do you rule out the potential bias around that? You know, it's mm. very, very hard because you yeah, can want that jurors job. are people. <laughs> yeah, you can tell yeah. them, don't pay attention to this. It always makes me think of yeah, in strike the trials, record, like, really? Yeah. Yeah. In trials when they're like, the jury will disregard that statement. It's like, can you actually? Yeah, um, probably not. So it's like, that's why just like prosecution and defense do it. They say something that they, they know is going to get objected. Yep. Like that they know someone's going to say like, I object to that, yep. but it's still going to stay in the juror's mind no matter how. I mean, this just happened with my divorce trial for crying out loud, where something was stated and it was like, you know, disregard X, Y, Z. And it's like, yeah, Yeah. okay. Like that, that, it was said for a reason. And I, I mean, fortunately, you know, I have the presence of mind in the sense of knowing what tactics are being used to generate escalated responses to make 
you know, me look some kind of a way, but that's the same kind of thing that frankly, you see these kind of individuals that you're talking about, these victims of sexual abuse and sexual assault are going through where these yeah. the opposing counsel will intentionally try to instigate and uh, get a reaction, an emotional reaction out of the victim in an effort to make their case of saying this person was crazy this person wasn't in their right state of mind clearly this person was doing xyz and it's yeah. just and then we wonder why people don't speak up why there's fewer yeah. people that come forward to report what happens to them yeah and being on the stand is already terrifying enough like you're sitting there in front of your rapist and you're trying to convince a jury that they actually raped you like mm -hmm. The most I vulnerable. Oh my can goodness. Only, yeah, can only imagine what it's like to sit there in front of someone who hurt you, like yeah. in one of the worst ways possible. And then you have people saying, like, you lied. Well, what were you wearing? Yeah. You were drunk. Like anything, any type of like defamation of character, which is like, who cares? Yeah. Like there's also the idea that like sex workers can't get raped. That's right. Incorrect. <laughs> like it does not matter what your profession is. That's right. Um, and that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for saying what, that, Olivia. Thank you for oh, saying yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Because it's true. Um, yeah, it does, I, does I, not I get matter. I'm very That's... upset with that aspect of like sex work, any kind of, you know, if you work in the stripping industry or OnlyFans or whatever it is that you're doing, that does not yeah. mean that you have your your uh, right to consent taken away yeah. you still it is still your body it is still your choice yeah does not matter if payment was already given same no. rules still apply no. like right. that does not count you still get to um, change your mind absolutely yeah. um and a lot of the times with like the alcohol component they'll try and say like well they were both drunk so they neither of them knew it's like neither of them could consent <laughs> then um it's like, it's still wrong. Like that doesn't, if anything, that makes your argument worse. Um, and this kind of, this, I, this does tie into another myth, which is like that men can't be raped. Mm, that burns me to my about. core. Yep. <laughs> uh, a lot of these burn me to my core. I'm probably going to say that for every single one that I say. But this um, is an excellent, this is excellent that you're bringing this full circle because you are so, so right about this and it is never talked about. No. Um, so according to the Department of Justice, actually one in 10 victims are male. Um, so, and the reason why that number might be low is because there's such a stigma attached to re one reporting that you yeah, have been raped. And then being a male who was raped because there is a whole other slew of rape myths associated with being a male victim. Well, um, and that one you know, in 10, I assume, is based on people who report. So like there's an unknown yeah. entity here of people, men who have been assaulted and who just never came forward. That number could be outrageous mm -hmm. beyond. Yeah, that number is most likely higher, like without a doubt higher. Um, it's so much harder it's hard in both situations, but it's a lot harder for men to report it. Um, but men can be raped. They can be raped by a woman. They can be raped by a man. So women can be rapist, despite what people think. Um, it does not matter if you mm -hmm. got an erection during it. You That's still right. did not consent. Um Right. Yeah. An I can just go. An erection, it does, right. And that's yeah. so much shame and, and same just with um, teenagers where we have seen this um, romanticized, I think, in the media when there is maybe a teen boy and a female teacher. Yes. Yep. We have seen this played out time and time again. There was a very famous case and um, I want to say it could have been in the 90s or maybe it was early, early 2000s. Um, I cannot remember the name of the boy, but those who are listening who are kind of in the same age range would remember mm -hmm. it was a um, Hispanic male and uh, a Caucasian female teacher. And they ended up having this, I mean, frankly, I feel this boy had Stockholm syndrome for lack of better words. Um, and it was of course not labeled that way, but they were 
they ended up quote unquote falling in love. They ended up having a child uh, together. She did go to prison. It was a whole, it was a whole thing, but you know, I just feel like we don't ever look at the fact that men and boys, teenagers, this does happen more often than people realize. And yeah. they're not speaking up because of the expectation of like, oh, look at you, big shot, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's like that, well, like, you should be happy. Like, mm -hmm. a woman wanted to have sex with you. It's like, no, I did not feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, does not matter how my body responded to it. That's right. um, same with there's with men, there's an additional stigma of if they get raped by a male, it's like, oh, now people think I'm gay. Like only yeah. gay men can get raped by other males. Yeah. Incorrect for the how many times have I said that this yeah. episode? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sexuality has nothing to do with it. Um, gender has nothing to do with it. Absolutely. It's just a rapist will rape who they want to. That's right. Um, and that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Another news I see your pup. I know. I was going to yes. say, Ellie's like diving out of the window back there. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really funny for those who are watching on YouTube. Nice yeah. little comedic relief here. But I know. My Ellie, my, Ellie is poking her head out the window at the moment. Yeah. And just She's like, hey, mom, this. the air's a little heavy in here. Do you think yeah. maybe we, we should go outside? <laughs> Open a window. <laughs> Look at that. It's so funny. I could not record at home because my dog. Whenever I start doing something, she's like, I must start barking now. You are not giving me attention. Therefore, I need to bark at nothing. So I was like, we're not even going to try this. Sounds like children too, right, Amber? Yeah, he, I was going to say, I have started toddler. locking the door, at least when there's another adult <laughs> home downstairs. Obviously, I can't do that if I'm recording solo. Um, because they will come up here and it will be like the perfect time to ask all the questions and like do all the things. So yes, mm -hmm. I, I sympathize. Stella generally just falls asleep and snores when we record. No. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Now I have the diva of dogs, which is very fitting for people who know me. Um, <laughs> I'm always like, if I had a daughter, this would be my daughter in dog form. She's sassy. She doesn't listen to me. She has quite the personality. She like she's like she's from New England, Olivia. She is from New England. <laughs> For any New England listeners, I love New England and it is no shame to be who you are. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> love it. But getting back on topic after I got distracted by a dog. Um <laughs> You're one of those people the, that when you walk down the street, you say hi to every dog, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. yeah. Whether but not, not the owners, I mean, sometimes just I the dogs. don't have a choice because my dog is like, we must be friends. And I've had to have the discussion with her that like, not everyone wants to be your friend. Um, she has not learned that yet. Um, so yes, no, I see dogs or animals and I'm like, hello. Um, we have the attention span of a squirrel. It's okay. Okay. It is okay. Too. Yes. <laughs> You're in good company, Olivia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Touche. Um, but the last myth I wanted to discuss, another one that I think is really incorrectly portrayed by the media is that you can is that you can only be raped by a stranger. Mm. Um oh yes, that's absolutely a full of shit myth. <laughs> this idea that all rapists hide in bushes like in night and they jump out at you while you walk on the sidewalk and while it does happen it's not as common as we think it is um the department of justice put out like they always put out like a list of statistics about like crimes um eight and ten are committed by an acquaintance um so I can really break it down further. I won't, but most of the time it's friends, friends of a friend, sadly family, mm -hmm. um, former or current partners. Um, a lot of the people know they're rapist. Most of the people know they're rapist. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this kind of goes back into like, you can't get raped by your spouse and things like that. Um, like you can only be raped if it's by a stranger, incorrect. <laughs> 
That's right. Um, and and I know that there might be some cultural norms out there or beliefs uh, associated yeah. with certain religions or places of origin that say, you know, just because you are married, that woman, that wife, that partner is now property that you own. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in this beautiful uh, United States of America that we live in, it is absolutely a crime to treat your partner like a piece of property because the person is human. So correct. Mm -hmm. That does not mean full-blown uh, consent to sex just because you are married. Yeah, there are, I don't remember which ones, but there are a couple of states that have laws about saying that you can't, like it's not rape if it's a spouse or a partner. That are still um, active to date? I believe so. Please do not quote me on this. I wow. referring I to and yeah. I, I have a research article is not open in front of me at the moment. And I read <laughs> it a couple months ago. So my brain is foggy. I read a lot of things. And there's also some states that have um same sex limitations as well. Um, like lesbians can't claim to be raped, gay men can't claim to be raped. Um, this which, is, I mean, that's just preposterous. That's just absolutely this blasphemy yeah. to think that still, that that would even exist still in us, in us, in one of the States in our country where we live is that's yeah. absolutely mind blowing. Um, it hurts my heart. Absolutely. Um, there's some just like general legislation that I read it about like what constitutes rape. And I'm like, you are just trying to let the rapist get off. Like you're trying, like they're so vague. Um, Wyoming, thank you Wyoming for taking me as a student out here, but they and Wyoming's rape law, they, can, they don't phrase it as sexual assault. They phrase it as sexual intrusion, which <laughs> Words matter. I have feelings Words about matter. that. Yeah. Cause I'm like, when you say intrude, I'm like, yeah, oh, sorry, they... you walked in the room and you intruded on my conversation. I don't think of rape. No. <laughs> um, so it's like legal wording really, really matters. And I think they also say sexual intrusion for child sexual assault as well. Um, which. I gonna... Yeah. I would <laughs> really like to know how they're defining intrusion in this context. I mean, yeah. Because it, honest, if it's where it, I think you're going with this, it's disgusting. Yeah, I mean, so, like profound that that would be that would be the limitation. Is there? Do you know what how they what how they define that? I mean, um, you might not. I, I know don't, you don't have, might not have it like. Right I don't know it off the top of my head, but it is similar. They they some states are also really wonky with how they phrase consent. Mm -hmm. um, some states don't include like yeah. alcohol as being a reason as to like why you can't consent. Um, I will say one of the states that has some of like the best uh, laws is New York, like mm -hmm. go New York for being really, really good. Um, so when I, for my study, I have to give a legal definition and I was like, oh, I'll pull Wyoming. So I went to my advisor. I was like, I cannot do this. Yeah. It's like, I'm sorry, but I was like, for the life of me, I cannot type this wording. So we pulled from New York and she was like, that is fine. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but my mind is going a thousand miles per hour right now. And I just have to take a moment to pause on this for a second because I'm sitting here. My brain has already jumped all the way over to abortion laws and abortion rights and all of this, uh, this shit show that we're seeing unfold in our own country. And I'm not trying to turn this into a political soapbox rant because that's not, that's not how I feel, but I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, semantics here right because words are very important and they are i get very hung up with certain words and need definitions to things or if i hear something i have to like rephrase it to make sure i'm understanding what the person means right so i'm sitting here and i just i'm like writing down this word consent and this word rape and this word intrusion and i'm just looking at it thinking how does this play into how politicians vote for or against certain aspects 
of uh, for or against aspects of abortion, right? Whenever mm. there's rape or incest that's being defined. And is it this definition that those lawmakers are then referring to on a state level to then guide their decision-making and information sharing over what is acceptable and what is not? And if that is the case, which I'm assuming is the case, yeah. um, it's overwhelming as hell to think about how much work needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Because unfortunately, like legal wording doesn't change often. Um, it takes right. a lot to decide on specific legal warning wording. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they often don't change it. And it's supposed to be that way because they're supposed to cover everything appropriately. Um, the thing that I like about New York is that they break it down like into different categories. So mm -hmm. they don't try and encompass everything in one. They have... Like Good. a different one for minors, a different one for people with physical disabilities and mental disabilities, a different one for rapes that involve force, ones for rapes that don't involve force, um, wow. because not all rape involves force <laughs> um, yeah. for those who don't right. know. Um, and some wow. states, I hate just bringing this back to Wyoming please don't kick me out of the program. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but that's just the only other law that's coming to my mind right now. They just have an adult one and a kid's one. And wow. it's correct to separate adults and children because yes. they are different things. Um, they may and... have one for physical and mental disabilities. Um, I'm not sure. But some, if you're going to do it that way, be a little more specific with your wording. Absolutely. Law should not be wishy-washy. And, and particularly so subjective. And yeah. that's yeah. where lawyers come into this, right? Is that you can rationalize and justify and spend things as much as you want to get yeah. your point across for your client that you're representing. And so yeah. this kind of turns into a segue to, you know, an area that I was hoping that we could touch on today, um, which is just Olivia, based off of what you have seen, the research that you've come across, the, the journal articles that you've read, um, do you have any kind of tidbits or anything like that that you might suggest for attorneys who are representing victims in, a, in the sense that any tidbits or advice on how they can become more trauma informed um, with how they're representing their client. So even if it's like things that they can do to better support their client, given they, they likely did not have the privy of having a class that was called psychology in the law, because many, yeah. many law schools do not offer this kind of information, which is where yeah. there's a huge disconnect, obviously, when we get into the verbiage and semantics of things, because words do matter. Yeah. Um, I thought about this a lot. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> as most people know. Um, <laughs> Which is probably a great thing because you can support and don't advocate make... on the other side yeah. very well. <laughs> yeah, I would not be a good lawyer. I would get too heated. Uh, I could not be <laughs> in control. Um, I think a couple of things come to mind. One, I think you really really, really need to prepare the victim if they're going to stand trial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what is going to be said or like what things are going to be talked about a little bit. Yeah, Prepare them for it. Prepare mm -hmm. them that, unfortunately, the defense loves victim blaming. Yeah. Prepare them for that because their trauma is going to get diminished significantly when they are on the stand. Um, and it's very hard to prepare someone for that, but don't send them in blind. And most lawyers do sit and like practice, like what it's going to look like, what's going to happen and how to try and like keep your emotions in check and not give in to what the defense is trying to show. Mm -hmm. But also like it can never be said too much. You can never like not warn someone enough, like yeah. let them know that. The defense is going this way because it's their job, not because it speaks to what happened to you. That's, um, right. That's huge. And I, I couldn't agree more is, is the value of um, 
just as humans, we like, we like categories, we like labels, we like to understand things, but particularly yeah. a human who has undergone significant trauma, expectation setting is crucial. So I think that's a wonderful suggestion. Yeah. And also just for lawyers to understand trauma, you don't need to know the full clinical definition. If you do, great. Um, but like, that's really going to help you with like defending if you understand like delayed emotional responses, tonic immobility, um, because then you're not just spewing random information. You're like, no, this is actually backed by the yeah. APA. This is backed by research. This is how victims respond. Some victims do respond in the ways that the lawyers are trying to present. That's actually mm -hmm. not the case all of the time. So my client's response is completely normal. It's completely appropriate. Um, right. Trauma reactive behaviors. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to just for lawyers to educate themselves on the nature yeah. of trauma reactive behaviors, but then also to connect that to the dots of expectation setting with the client and labeling these mm -hmm. things as normal and understandable. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's yeah. profound. Yeah. And the defense normally does go hard with the victim blaming. It's very hard. It's like when I was putting together my study, we were, been, we were initially going to try and like manipulate victim blame. So it's like, is either going to be present or is going to be absent? And when we were writing it, we were like, wow, it's really hard to write case materials of a cross-exam of the witness without victim blaming being a part of it. Yeah. Um, unless wow. the victim like didn't see who did it, we we're like, okay, you can go that route of like, do you even know if this is the person? But it's like, a lot of the defense's foundation is based in these myths and kind of being prepared to counteract it. So unfortunately, being aware of them and that they're out there and that that's most likely what is going to be targeted. And if you can bring in an expert, that will help. Yeah, The effectiveness of it, unfortunately, depends on how susceptible the jury is to hearing that information. Mm -hmm. But if you can have an actual expert there to go against what is being said and experts also like this was, I feel like I always had this idea of expert witnesses based off of like law and order SVU um, and kind yeah. of like the media experts actually don't interview anyone involved in the case. They don't know the case details. They don't know anything that's going on. So they are truly just giving a research fact based opinion mm -hmm. and I feel like when you know that it's like they're not here just to be paid because the prosecution paid them right to like defend what was going on um so they're there with actual information and if you can present that and if people understand what an expert actually is yeah, and how yeah. an expert is different from like a therapist like someone's therapist who comes in yeah. someone's doctor who comes in mm -hmm. like a forensic examination examiner sure. uh, yeah a forensic psychologist <laughs> or exam yeah, yeah sure. things like that that's a good it's call a out lot that's different that's a very good call out because you're right that neutrality is important to emphasize for uh, the the jury to know, but also the the um, the I was going to say the client. My goodness, the victim <laughs> of the sexual yeah. assault who yeah. is going to be prepared for this. Because again, it, depending on what that expert is being called to share, even if it's by opposing counsel, um, yeah, you know the the neutral statistics that could be getting presented. Uh, could be very hard for a victim to hear because they're obviously, I mean, as anyone would in this situation, they, they would likely personalize it and feel yeah. like, yep. wow, you know, um, and, and you are so much more than a statistic. Yep. I think a lot yeah. of what you've shared is good for folks who would be called to be jurors as well. Like I know yeah. the intent of that question was to prepare a lawyer or someone representing um, but I feel like a lot of this, just being a more informed human walking into that situation yeah. and understanding, like I did not watch law and order. I don't do any of those things, but mm -hmm. I had certain ideas of what the expert is or does or how they're brought in. And it mm -hmm. didn't, 
necessarily occur to me that that is a non-biased person, that they're not heavily involved in the case and the details and, you know, that they've been led astray. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good call out to just maybe be more informed going into those situations. I've never been on jury duty. Um, I yeah. quite frankly don't think I would be a very good juror. Um, <laughs> what? I think you'd be amazing, Amber. Are you you'd kidding be good. me? Yeah. You'd be so good. Be mm. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I don't know. because you don't have the um, the influence, the external influences that have hijacked your experience of certain uh, things, to keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> okay, to be fair, anybody who's listening that picks jurors, please don't pick me. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I don't think that's how that works. That way. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> doesn't work that way. That works. Oh, come Not on. Here. Um, no, but I think this is really good information for someone who doesn't have the... Um, background that the two of you have, because there are many people like me uh, walking around in the world that are just oblivious to a lot of this information. So I appreciate you sharing it, Olivia. And this, yeah. I mean, this discussion, while very heavy and very filled with um, hard information, I think is something that more people need to learn about and know about um, just to be better yeah. humans, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. I think like, it's okay to admit that you don't know something. Like, it's fine to be like, oh, I actually didn't know that because the media is there to lead you astray. If you don't know anything other than what is being presented to you, like, that's not your own fault. It's your fault if you fight against new information and yeah. if you continue to, like, push against it. But if you are someone who is open to learning and you just didn't know something, like, that's not your fault. Um, right. And that's yeah. why, you know... you take the initiative and try to do some, some research. If you can do, yeah. you know, do look up some stuff online to help, help you become more trauma informed. If that is the case yeah. um, for, and I say you meaning the generalized you not a specific <laughs> yeah. person. I'm not talking, you know, but um, yeah. We can all I, do a little bit better. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. State of Wyoming, state of New York, no matter yeah, I'm how looking at good, you, bad and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't get me kicked out. <laughs> no, no. Hey, I'll say call out to North Carolina too, because let me tell yeah. you, North, the state of North Carolina has got some some laws that are so incredibly antiquated that it blows my mind that they are even in existence. And and frankly, yeah. like I'm I'm seriously on my little notepad over here. I've got you know just the words of rape and consent. I just keep coming back to this. Like I now I now want to know. How are the, mm -hmm. how are these words defined in in our states? Um, Each state most likely has a different definition. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, and I've been trying to I've been searching in the back of my mind here. There was a there was something I worked on in the past, research oriented, and I cannot remember it. I cannot remember what it was to save my life, and so I'm going to have to go back to that. But where mm -hmm. these words really were very significant, and I. Um, because they were so drastically different with each state. Um, I believe it was whenever I was researching age of consent uh, pertaining mm -hmm. to a case I was working on because it, it's just, mm -hmm. and then whenever you get into what it actually means, uh, it, it can be heart wrenching really mm -hmm. yeah. when you get yeah. into it. Um, yeah. So just as a side note, I actually am in, in the, on a side note as part of the consultation part of my coaching business, um, I am developing a trauma informed certification to support lawyers with becoming more trauma informed because it is mm -hmm. a personal mission that I am very, very passionate about in terms of um, educating lawyers on how to become more trauma informed to protect their clients and to retain their mm -hmm. clients and to help them um, understand how to protect them whenever they are on the stand because it is such a scary experience mm. yeah absolutely big time yep it's terrifying olivia what is like the one big takeaway that you want our audience to walk away with um now that you know you've shared a lot of amazing information with us today and i really thank you for for doing that what is the one big thing you want people to take away or to learn from today's episode um, I would say that there's no such thing as a prototypical victim. There's no such thing as a po prototypical situation uh, or a prototypical perpetrator. Anyone can be raped. Anyone can be a rapist. Does not matter who they are or what situation, sexuality, gender does not play a role into it. Um, so just things that are 
push down your throats as to what is considered the most often. Most likely, yes, it happens, but it's most likely not the most typical. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and I think that, you know, your mission to remove um, victim blaming from the legal system is a, that is a uh, long road, my dear, but I seriously yeah. want to commend the hell out of you for taking on this mission of, of doing your part of being the drop in the bucket that helps yeah. move the needle in the right direction over time. Um, because that's, that's the power of when people combine, uh, start to move in that same direction as a collective, that's when real change happens. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely in a great environment to have. There's a lot of us now who are pushing against it just at like where I am now. I'm lucky enough. I have a mentor who is also a badass woman who is like, yes, do it, do the things lead it awesome and I'm other people it, at girl. the university of wyoming <laughs> university of wyoming psych and law program is fantastic um who That's were awesome. all just like no like fighting for change um and hopefully That's one day it'll happen yeah y'all are doing amazing work and seriously mm -hmm. shout out to university of wyoming for you know, facilitating an environment in a, yeah. in a tough atmosphere, frankly, it sounds like, you know, to be doing this kind of research, because that can be very highly contested, obviously, yes. when you play yeah. into the politics of university yeah. and pol I mean, like, it just, it gets really messy. So you know, shout yeah. out to them for, for creating a space for that to be possible, because um, yes. even as someone myself, I've actually also looked into programs for psychology and the law, and there aren't too many programs out there that offer this um nope. i mean you could pr probably count on one hand but <laughs> yeah there's not many yeah um so i'm i'm really proud of you for pursuing this and i cannot wait to see what you end up doing thank you yes yes i'm excited although that is many years from now <laughs> okay. yes. but you're gonna you're gonna get there and make change, make change happens little by little yeah That's right. yes we That's want it right. to happen in big chunks and we want it to happen all at once. Yep. But the reality is it's day by day, yeah. um, small step by small step. So definitely keep that up. Yeah. Yep. And you. so for our listeners, um, if you want to follow uh, Olivia's academic Twitter account, we're going to include that in the show notes. That's where she puts all things research and dog related. Um, and obviously Bruce Springsteen. I completely yes. forgot that you were a diehard fan of him. So. <laughs> Die hard. Yes. I have tickets to his concert in March and I will cry. I'm just going to throw that out there now. I'm going to be the youngest person there crying over a 70 year old man but yes you can follow me <laughs> i love it i love can, it so you will get academic stuff but you will see my dog and you will see bruce springsteen things <laughs> i mean i'm here for it and i'll follow you hey it sounds like <laughs> a party to me so <laughs> yeah that's right in addition we ask that our listeners don't forget to follow us as well on social media you will see in our show notes our link tree which has all the things associated with what the fox podcast um and we are really trying hard to boost awareness of the fact that we do have a youtube channel so youtube.com backslash at what the fox podcast please click subscribe and we will plan to see you next tuesday see you next tuesday bye thank you and we all say everything is gonna be just fine it's gonna fall into place the sun is gonna set on your terrible day